Hello aspirants, I once again welcome you all to Editorial Analysis of Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 16th of September 2024. Now let us see the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. In this first article, we are going to see about the mineral ecosystem that is prevailing in India. And in the second article, we are going to see about the rural and urban continuum. So without much delay, let us get into the news article discussion. Now look at this article about rural urban continuum. Here this word continuum is very important because the entire article talks about this rural urban continuum in specific. So what is continuum? It is a continuous change that is occurring in a particular thing or phenomenon. So we have four distinct seasons, right? So it is distinct as well as continuous. So one follows the other. Similarly, our India, we are facing rural to urban shift and it is happening continuously even without us noticing. So the author of this article states that instead of providing financial resources separately for the rural and urban, we can provide the financial assistance that actually recognizes this continuum which leads to the ultimate development of both rural and urban area. So this is what the article is about. In this news article discussion, let us see what are all the challenges faced by the rural development and how it can be rectified from the the mains perspective. So let's start with the causes of rural backwardness. See the first important thing is infrastructure deficiency. See, see when an area lacks connectivity through road, railway and digital connection, it actually does not attract any education institution, any industry, any kind of healthcare service providers and etc. So what happens here is the rural people, they have to migrate to the urban area in order to get all the access to the services that they required. So the main problem because behind this is the lack of connectivity and also there is inadequate utilities as well here utilities in terms of water sanitation and electricity this also again affects the setting up of any industries or innovation that brings development to the region thirdly there is underdeveloped health care this impacts the demographic dividend of any particular rural area Secondly, there is limited access to education. We only have primary education and secondary education at the rural levels. And that too, we have very poor educational facilities. So this is leading to low literacy rate. And again, it does not attract any businesses to develop the region. Thirdly, agrarian distress. Most of the rural people, they depend on agriculture and are vulnerable to climate change. They also lack access to economic tools like collateral free loans and etc. So this is increasing the debt and poverty in the particular rural region. Apart from this, there are social inequalities and discrimination like caste and gender discrimination. Even today in certain villages, certain caste people cannot cultivate a particular land and a particular type of crop. And again, there is a social stigma associated with this casteism. And there are political marginalization. Even though the even though women has reservation, they are lacking representation in the local bodies. And again, this is leading to weaker local governance. Also, due to the lack of availability or accessibility of a lot of services, migration and brain drain actually happens. There is also slow technological adaptation and increased digital divide. So these are all the causes of rural backwardness. So what are all the constitutional provisions that are available for rural development? We shall say them one by one. So the first one is the 73rd Amendment Act of 1992, which led to the establishment of Panchayat Raj institution and the municipality institution. See, even before the institution of this act, we had Panchayat Raj at each stage but their composition, powers and functions varied. So that is why the 73rd Amendment Act was brought in to bring a uniformity to all the Panchayat Raj institutions. And it again, and it gave a three-tier structure that is the central government, state government and the local bodies. And these local bodies again get divided into three tier body. First is the Gram Panchayat, then Panchayat Samiti, then Zilla Parishad. Even DPSP in Article 40, we have a mandate to, orga a mandate to organize village Panchayat. And under Article 243G, Panchayats can plan and implement schemes. And Article 245H, they can raise funds through taxes. And under Article 275, they can 
even receive grant and aid for rural development programs. So these are all the constitutional provisions for rural development. Now let us quickly go through certain government initiatives for rural development. So the first one is the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act in short called as MG Enrega. 2005. See, this act provides at least 100 days of guaranteed wage employment per year to rural households. So, even the unskilled persons, they can get employment under this particular scheme. This has actually led to the development of or the rejuvenation of water bodies around rural area and have solved the unemployment crisis. Secondly, the Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana launched in 2016 under the scheme affordable housing will be provided to rural poor or in other words it provides subsidy to whoever is dreaming of building their own house thirdly we have pradhan mantri gram sadak yojana it is a rural connectivity project that aims to construct all weather roads connecting all the rural and the urban hubs fourthly we have the swachh bharat mission Gramin, it was launched in 2014. It aims to, the purpose of this mission is to eliminate open defecation in rural India by constructing household toilets and promoting sanitation practices. This is a very successful project. Then comes the Deen Dayal Antodaya Yojana or the National Rural Livelihood Mission, in short called as Day NRLM. It was launched in 2011. So it focuses on reducing rural poverty through the promotion of diversification and gaining self-employment and finally we have the Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bhima Yojana here Fasal means farmer so it provides insurance coverage and financial support for farmers in the event of crop failure so these are all very important government initiatives for rural development now let us quickly go through the challenges in bringing development to the region firstly limited infrastructure secondly inadequate transportation and communication facilities and thirdly social factors we saw them priorly just giving a recap to you then moving on to the way forward we require a coordinated effort for infrastructure development. For this, even the panchayat, they can institute taxes and work on bringing connectivity to the region. So what happens here is the panchayats, they get grants from the state as well as the center and they get interest payments for the projects that, ha that they have done earlier. So this is restricting them to put even more taxes to the people but ultimately it is affecting the funding mechanism for any upcoming long term projects so this should be solved so this should be solved through coordinated effort apart from this we have to bring in targeted social programs this will eliminate the social stigma and bring in awareness about the rights of any person who is vulnerable finally we have to foster local participation by including them in the decision making process so all these can bring a new change to the system. So we have a main question for you. Discuss the challenges associated with rural urban migration and its impact in rural area. Suggest measures for balance for balancing the rural and urban development. So you can write an answer for this particular question and post it in the comment section. We will review your answer. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article. Now look at this editorial article about DMF. DMF is nothing but District Mineral Foundation. So, the author of this article states that from the institution of this DMF, currently it has collected up to 1 lakh crore rupees of corpus and it has led to decentralized community centric development. So, what is this DMF is all about? Let us understand that from the main's perspective in this newspaper analysis. Now, before getting into that, you should understand the purpose of this DMF. See, DMF acts like a foundation where all the leaseholders, they pool their lease royalties and this particular fund is used for the development of the particular area where the mining activity is actually happening. So in simple words, this fund will help in developing the mined area and rehabilitating the local community present in that region. So remember, it was established by the Mines and Minerals Act 2015 and it aims at socio-economic development of mining affected regions. Now, as I said earlier, currently it has accumulated nearly 1 lakh crore rupees and it has been distributed across 645 districts in 23 states. So, it focuses mainly on the community needs, environmental impact and the sustainable development. So, we can say that DMF is a vehicle for decentralized and community-centric 
development. So this is the background about this DMF. Now let us see some of the recent updates to this DMF. See, even though it was instituted in 2014, currently it has launched a national DMF portal. This was launched for transparency and efficiency of this entire process. So this innovation not only helps in community involvement through the Gram Sabhas, but also helps in project monitoring and socio-economic indicators. So when we talk about the socio-economic indicators, we cannot leave education, healthcare, water supply and infrastructure aside, right? So it also focuses on all these aspects and helps in aligning the resource allocation that is available with the center and the state in a way that it is useful for the local need in a particular time. So this ensures whole of government approach for socio-economic upliftment. Now let us see the key programs that complement this TMF. The first important one is this Pradhan Mantri Kanij Sheshtra Kalyan Yojana. It focuses on improving living standards in the mining districts. So, having seen about what is this DMF, its purpose and what are the key programs that align with this DMF. Now, let us quickly go through the advantages and disadvantages of DMF. See, when we talk about advantages, it brings economic and social development in the mining affected area and it provides inclusivity and participation of the community. Apart from this, it focuses on environmental aspects leading to sustainable development. So, on one part, when mining is done, on the other part, the royalty is used to develop the particular region that is affected by these mining. Thirdly, it helps in digitalization and transparency due to the usage of this national DMF portal and it enables the convergence of resources from the center and the state. So, the, so these are the advantages of DMF. When we talk about the disadvantages, there are uneven implementation of the fund of the project funded by these DMFs. So, this is again leading to regional disparity and affecting the socio-economic indicators in a particular region. Secondly, there is overlapping jurisdiction between the center and the state. So, this collapse between the resource allocation is actually delaying the process of development in a region. Thirdly, all these DMF projects are focusing only on the short term goals and fail to think in a larger scale bringing in long term sustainability. So this is a very big challenge and finally there are administrative challenges in implementing the projects like there are community resistance due to lack of awareness and there is delay in the release of funds and the works they also get delayed due to administrative challenges. So having seen about the advantages and disadvantages, now let us see about the way forward what can be done to address these challenges. So the first thing is to bring in capacity development at the district level itself. So this will reduce the regional disparity, enhances the resource allocation and bring in development in a seamless manner. Secondly, we have to focus on sustainability meaning we should focus on both the short term as well as long term goals. Thirdly, we have to replicate best practices from the world. This can include encouraging cross district knowledge sharing and technology transfer. And finally, we should work for greater community participation to actually bring in the change that we envision to achieve. So these are all very important facts that you have to remember about DMF. So far we saw about when it was established, what is the purpose of it, then we saw the government initiative that is related to it, then we saw what are the advantages and disadvantages of this particular DMF and we saw the way forward. Now let us solve a main question. Let me read out the question for you. How minerals infrastructure can both be a boon and a ban for a country like India? Discuss. So you can write answer for this question and post it in the comment section. So with this we came to the end of the news article discussion. If you like the video hit like, do comment and don't forget to subscribe to Shankaraya's Academy YouTube channel. Now thank you so much for listening.